Good afternoon. My name is Adam Smith from Nobel Prize Outreach, which is the outreach arm of the Nobel Foundation based in Stockholm, Sweden. I would like to welcome you all very much to this afternoon's event, which is a lecture from Dr. William Kalin, 2019 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. The lecture is part of the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative, which is a partnership between AstraZeneca and Nobel Prize Outreach designed to take Nobel laureates around the world to meet the next generation of scientists. In other words, all of you in the auditorium today. We've been running this program for a decade and we've visited over 50 universities on four continents. And today I am delighted to be visiting Astorias. And I'd like to thank Finbar and the Health Research Institute of Astorias for so warmly welcoming us. And I'd particularly like to thank all of you who've taken the trouble to be with us today in the auditorium. Now the event is going to be moderated from the auditorium by Luzmar Gonzalez, so it's my pleasure to hand over to Luzmar. And hello everybody, good afternoon Asturias, good afternoon London, and good morning in Boston. Um, I'm Dr. Luzmar Gonzalez Arias, uh, the coordinator of the research group HEAL, Health, Environment, Arts and Literature, Developing Work in Medical Humanities here at the University of Oviedo. And as Adam has said, I will be co-chairing this session with him um, here at the auditorium of the Central University Hospital in Asturias. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session with Dr. William Kaling, 2019 Nobel, Pla Nobel Prize Laureate in Medicine, who will be offering us a talk with the very stimulating title of My Unlikely Journey to Estocolm, Why Science is Like Fishing. Thank you, Dr. Kaling, for sharing your work and above all your time with all of us. I'm sure this talk and this afternoon will stay with us for a very long time and will be a source of inspiration. Um, on behalf of the Asturias Oviedo side of things, I would like to thank both Dr. Kaling and Adam for your presence here. We would have liked to welcome you physically to Asturias, particularly in this very sunny autumn. Autumn is treating us very, very kindly this year. Uh, but hopefully our paths will cross face to face sooner rather than later and we'll be able to show you around not only our laboratories and research centers, but also the breathtaking landscapes and coastline of the northwest of, of Spain. Um, in the meantime, we're very grateful to the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative for making it possible for all of us to meet in this virtual space. So thank you very much. So it's, it only remains for me to introduce William Kalin to, uh, and to welcome him to give his talk and also to say that the, the technical team at Finbar and ISPA and here in London have worked incredibly hard to make this communication channel as smooth as it can be despite the virtual barriers and so we have the possibility of asking questions directly to William Kalin afterwards and I do encourage you please to ask as many questions as you like at the end of the lecture. It's lovely to get that communication going. And to a certain extent, that's what this initiative is all about, bringing the laureate and the young scientist as close together as possible. So, William Kalin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for those lovely uh, introductions. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I'm happy to be with you uh, virtually. And I thank the Nobel Foundation for all of the work making this possible. So for the young people in the audience, I was born in 1957, which I know is unimaginably a uh, long time ago. Uh, and if I had to describe my childhood, I would say I was the beneficiary of having devoted parents. I had uh, great teachers, including many women who today I think would be CEOs or doctors or lawyers, but I'm embarrassed to say that back in the 60s, many bright women were told if they wanted a career, their options were to be nurses, teachers, or nuns. And so I, unfortunately, I feel guilty. I was the beneficiary of that uh, horrible situation. I had ample unstructured time which, to play and, and amuse myself. And I had many uh, toys that stimulated an interest in science or engineering, such as a microscope, a chemistry set, construction toys, et cetera, et cetera. And this wasn't an accident because again, Sputnik was launched in 1957 and that gave rise to the space race and certainly also uh, contributed to the Cold War between Russia and the United States. So uh, many boys, and again, I'm embarrassed to say it was mostly boys growing up in the 60s in the United States had such toys. Uh, in fact, here's my childhood uh, microscope that I received when I was about nine or 10 years old. 
Uh, now, if I was to describe myself as a high school student, I would say I liked learning concepts and ideas. I liked objective subjects where there was a right answer and a wrong answer. And I especially liked playing. Uh, I disliked memorizing facts. I disliked subjective subjects that were simply a matter of opinion. And I would say in general, I didn't like to study uh, very much. I'd rather be out in the yard playing. Uh, now I have to introduce you to the American grading, grading system if you're not familiar with it already. So an A is excellent, uh, a B is good, and C is satisfactory. But I put good in quotes because it really wasn't all that good uh, if you got a B. So uh, I would say during high school, I was mostly a mediocre student. I mostly got Bs with the exception of fortunately math came very easily to me and I could get an A in my mathematics studies without studying. So I got A's in mathematics, but otherwise I was an undistinguished uh, high school student. Uh, but fortunately for me, while I was in high school, my high school got a computer terminal that was one of the first, uh, it was actually one of the first high schools to have a computer terminal. Uh, this was linked to a mainframe at a nearby university. And so these were the early days of computer science. And to me, computer science was mathematics brought to life. And so I got very excited about uh, computer science. It was actually the first subject that actually uh, really started to make me think, well, maybe this will be my career one day. And fortunately, because of my math uh, aptitude scores, I was actually selected one summer while in high school to go to Florida Atlantic University and study college level mathematics and computers. And this was really the first time that I was exposed to a curriculum that was really challenging and exciting. And it was the first time I was surrounded by people who by and large were at least as smart and in some cases much smarter uh, than I was. Uh, now, as the summer wore on, I was delighted to learn that actually I could hold my own intellectually with many of these students, but almost all of them had better grades than I did because they all had much better study habits. And I could also appreciate that in hindsight, I had simply been bored in high school. So for my senior year, uh, so first of all, one take home message here is to try to surround yourself with people who are smarter and more talented than you are at every opportunity. It might make you feel good if you're always the smartest person in the room but you will learn much more and grow much faster if you're surrounded by people who are smarter and more talented than you are. Uh, so for my senior year in high school, I decided to uh, uh, challenge myself. I took the most challenging courses and I actually did my homework for a change. I actually did study for the exams. And so now I got uh, all A's, uh, so that was good. Uh, and I went to Duke University as a pre-medical student. So you might ask, what happened to computers? Well, I, I'm embarrassed to say I did not see the personal computer revolution that was around the corner. And to me, a life in computer science would have meant writing computer code in a dark room for industrial applications or perhaps military applications. And I wanted a career where I could interact with people on a daily basis and hopefully do some good in the world. So I kind of pivoted from computer science to medicine. Uh, and while a junior in college, uh, someone encouraged me to do a laboratory research uh, project to enhance my chance of getting into medical school. And I was given a project, which I can say with the benefit of hindsight was uninteresting, unimportant, and frankly, undoable. Uh, and I had the audacity to tell my professor during my last laboratory meeting that this project that he had been working on for seven or eight years was actually based on a laboratory artifact and would certainly never be brought to completion. So he rewarded me uh, for this insight by giving me a, a C minus for my first uh, laboratory uh, research experience. And then uh, to add a little further punitive uh, flair, he wrote in the margin of my college transcript that Mr. Kalen appears to be a bright young man whose future lies outside uh, the laboratory. So this was not a very encouraging or auspicious start to my uh, research career. And so a take home message here is if you are struggling in a laboratory, it might be your fault, or it might be that you simply are in the wrong lab or have the wrong project or the wrong mentor. Now with this uh, C minus in hand, uh, I was rejected actually from many uh, medical schools, including uh, Harvard Medical School, where I'm now a full uh, professor. So I guess I got even, uh, but as you heard, I did get into Duke uh, Medical School. In fact, here's me. Uh, you can tell this is the 70s from this haircut. Uh, so I arrived at uh, Duke Medical School in 1979. Uh, and during our third year of medical school, we were encouraged to work in a laboratory and do some research. So with some trepidation, I gave it another try and I 
worked in a laboratory that studied tumor blood flow, where my mentor was Randy Jertle. This is actually me at my first scientific poster in 1982. Uh, and this is my first paper, uh, where my mentor again was Randy Jertle. And one of the take home messages here was, the most important thing for a young person entering the lab is to have something, I would say to a first approximation, anything uh, work. So they start to get a taste of the joy and excitement of doing uh, scientific research. Now, uh, this still wasn't enough to convince me, however, that I was gonna be a researcher. I thought I would be a clinician. I, here I am as an intern at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1983. And I was so sure I was gonna be a clinical doctor that I stayed an extra year at Johns Hopkins and was the chief uh, medical uh, resident. But the person who changed my life was uh, David Livingston. So I, after leaving Johns Hopkins, I went to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to uh, train as a medical oncologist. Uh, and again, uh, we were encouraged to try working in a research laboratory to uh, supplement the clinical work we were doing. And I had the good fortune of working for David Livingston. And now if everything in my first lab was wrong, everything in this lab was right. I had a great project. The project was important. It was interesting. It was doable. And I had a great mentor. And David taught me many, many things. But one was to ask important questions. And one was to be your own worst critic. Now, uh, I started my own laboratory in 1992. And shortly thereafter, this paper appeared in Science, which was the cloning of the so-called von Hippolindau gene. This is the gene that, when mutated, gives rise to a hereditary cancer syndrome called von Hippolindau uh, disease. This disease affects about one in 35,000 people. It's passed on from generation to generation to generation in what would appear clinically to be an autosomal dominant pattern, although as you'll see in a minute, at the molecular level, it's actually recessive. Uh, and the classical tumors seen in this syndrome are blood vessel tumors called hemangioblastomas of the central nervous system and retina. Clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which I highlight in red because it's the most common form of kidney cancer, which in turn is one of the 10 most common cancers in the developed world, as well as pheochromocytomas, which is a, a adrenal gland tumor. So the situation in VHL disease is that the individual has inherited a defective VHL gene from mom or dad. So here I'm showing you schematically the maternal and paternal copies of chromosome three. The VHL gene resides on the short arm of chromosome three. So I've shown you here with the asterisk that in this scenario, or schematic, the individual has inherited a defective VHL gene from mom, but they're initially okay because the paternal copy is still present. But unfortunately, if you're born with a defective version of the VHL gene, you have a 90% chance that one or more susceptible cells in your body will spontaneously mutate or lose the remaining uh, normal copy of the VHL gene. And that cell can go on to form a tumor. And that's why clinically this looks like an autosomal dominant. Now, as you would predict from the knowledge that inherited DHL mutations predisposed to, for example, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, if you now look at non-hereditary clear cell renal cell carcinoma, you again see that the maternal and the paternal copies of the VHL gene have frequently been mutated or lost. But here, both mutational events or hits, if you will, have occurred sometime after conception in contrast to VHL disease where the first hit occurred in the germline. Now, I knew from my clinical training that the tumors seen in VHL disease are, are notorious for inducing new blood vessels. And that's because they overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor and they occasionally stimulate excess red blood cell production, and that's because they can sometimes ectopically produce erythropoietin. And what VEGF and erythropoietin have in common is that they're normally induced when cells or tissues are starved of oxygen. And so this was the hint that the VHL gene product must be involved in oxidant sensing. Now, to test this in the laboratory, uh, we did a, a simple set of experiments that I'm summarizing here. And for the students in science, simple is not bad, simple is good. So we created match cell line pairs where the VHL protein was present or absent. We grew them in incubators that had, had low oxygen or high oxygen. And then we measured the abundance of so-called hypoxia inducible mRNA, such as the mRNA for VEGF. And as we suspected, uh, in the cells that lacked the VHL protein, they produced high levels of these hypoxia inducible mRNAs, whether oxygen was or was not limiting. In other words, they had lost the ability to sense oxygen. 
Now, I have to tell you one more piece of jargon here just to make sure we're all on the same page. You know, we, scientists talk about genes being expressed or not expressed, or if you will, being on or off. And when we say they're on or being expressed, it's because they're being converted into mRNA copies, which again, of course, are the instructions for making the corresponding protein. And this is usually under the control of so-called transcription factors. So it turns out we knew from the work of many laboratories, including my fellow laureates, Sir Peter Radcliffe and Greg Semenza, that many of these hypoxia-inducible mRNAs were under the control of a transcription factor called hypoxia-inducible factor, or HIF for short. And we knew again from their work that HIF was made up of an unstable alpha subunit that was normally degraded when uh, oxygen was plentiful, as well as a stable beta subunit that was better known as orange. And over the course of time, uh, we and others showed that the VHL protein is actually part of a so-called ubiquitin ligase complex that in the presence of oxygen binds directly to the HIF alpha subunits and targets them for proteasomal degradation. Whereas when oxygen levels are low, or the VHL protein has been mutated, now HIF alpha can accumulate, dimerize with ORNT and activate genes such as VEGF. But of course, this begs the question, how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not available and hence whether it should destroy uh, HIF alpha? And so the answer uh, that we arrived at and uh, Sir Peter Radcliffe arrived at in parallel working independently was in the presence of oxygen, one of two prolyl residues in HIF alpha gets hydroxylated. Uh, this has never been seen before as an intracellular uh, signaling mechanism. Uh, and this prolyl hydroxylation then uh, generates a high affinity VHL uh, binding site. Uh, and the enzymes that do the work here are the so-called agolan or sometimes alternatively called PhD prolyl hydroxylases. These enzymes split molecular oxygen and use one of the oxygen atoms to hydroxylate HIF. Uh, and I should also point out these enzymes have very low oxygen affinity, so they're very sensitive to changes and oxygen availability over a physiologically relevant range. And finally, these enzymes require a cofactor, which is called either 2-oxoglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate, which then gets decarboxylated to succinate. And already, some drug companies are making inhibitors of these enzymes that compete with 2-oxoglutarate with the idea that if you could stabilize HIF, you could turn on red blood cell production, and maybe that would be useful for diseases such as anemia and ischemia. In fact, uh, one such uh, drug is a drug called Roxadustat, uh, which has been through phase three trials uh, for the treatment of anemia linked to chronic uh, kidney disease. Uh, this drug's now been approved in many uh, countries around the world, including in China, Japan, and uh, Europe. Here I am in Beijing in 2018 watching Roxadustat being produced for the Chinese market. Now, returning to the role of uh, HIF, however, in cancer, because we started out by talking about the fact that VHL loss predisposes to kidney cancer, uh, by doing gain of function studies and loss of function studies, we could show that the problem in kidney cancers that lack the VHL protein is that HIF2 is driving their tumor growth. And if anything, HIF1 alpha is seemingly serving to constrain tumor growth. And in fact, in many cancers, kidney cancers, HIF1 is actually silenced or lost. And so HIF2 is really the bad guy in kidney cancer. So what can we do about this? Well, fortunately, by the 90s, a number of companies were making VEGF inhibitors to block angiogenesis. And we argued if these were going to work in any solid tumor, they should work in kidney cancer, given this intimate link between VHL, HIF, and VEGF. And I'm happy to report, I think we're now up to eight VEGF inhibitors that are approved for the treatment of kidney cancer. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that these drugs don't work for every kidney cancer patient. And even those patients who do initially respond will eventually progress. So how could you do better? Well, based on first principles, you would say, let's target HIF itself. And based on what I told you, we should be targeting HIF too. But the conventional wisdom was that HIF as a DNA binding transcription factor wouldn't be druggable. But fortunately, Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner ignored that dogma and they identified a potentially druggable pocket in HIF2 alpha, and they identified a chemical scaffold that could bind to this pocket, and in so doing, induce an allosteric change such that HIF2 alpha could not bind to ORNT and could not bind to DNA. These were then later optimized by a company called Peloton, where the medicinal chemistry improved the drug-like properties of these chemicals, and they provided to us a tool compound called PT2399, which we show was very active in uh, preclinical models of kidney cancer, so showing that this compound could decrease HIF-dependent mRNAs 
proliferation and, and tumor growth in new mice. Now, eventually a more advanced version of this compound now called Belcidivin went into phase two trials uh, in patients with advanced kidney cancer. These are patients who had failed standard of care agents, including VEGF inhibitors. Uh, these are so-called swimmers plots where every horizontal line is one patient on the study and how long they were on therapy. At the end of this analysis, so for orientation, the dotted vertical line is one year on therapy. All of the patients with the black arrows were still doing well on the drug at the time of this analysis, and the yellow stars were patients whose tumors had a so-called resist objective response. And so uh, based on these promising data, this drug has now gone into phase three testing. Now, another truism in medical oncology is most drugs work better in a frontline setting or an early stage of disease compared to in late lines of therapy when the disease has far progressed. So we, where we were able to convince Peloton and Merck to test this drug in 61 patients who had VHL disease, who had measurable kidney tumors that had never been treated medically. These patients were in surveillance programs getting frequent CTs or MRIs. Uh, and this was in an attempt to delay or prevent the need for repeated surgeries, which you would otherwise have to do in these patients because of their multiple uh, tumors. Uh, and here you can see that almost all the patients appeared to derive uh, some benefit. And I'm also happy to report that some of the other non-kidney tumors in these patients, such as the hemangioblastomas also responded. Uh, and based on these data, this drug has now been approved by the FDA. But I can tell you, even before the, the paper started appearing, if, you, if you, you young people know how to go on social media, if you, if you went on social media, you could see that the VHL patients were already posting that in many cases they were responding to this drug. So you can see here's a VHL patient saying, I never thought I'd see this day. And imagine that these patients have seen this disease ravage their family generation after generation. And this patient's describing tumors that either uh, were stable, got smaller, or in some cases disappeared. And as I mentioned, uh, just in August, the FDA approved this drug for the treatment of von Hippel-Lindau disease. Uh, so in closing, why is science like fishing? Well, you have to learn some techniques, but that turns out to be the easiest part of this whole endeavor. If the right person is teaching you, I'm sure you can learn the techniques. Uh, the second part is picking a good problem to work on, like picking a good place to fish is really, really important. Now, in my case, my clinical training, I think was quite helpful because it helped me understand or appreciate that the working on the VHL gene would probably be a very good place uh, to fish. And finally, uh, there is some luck involved. If the mechanism had turned out to be inelegant or clunky when all was said and done, uh, there would have been no talk of going uh, to Stockholm. But fortunately for us, uh, nature had provided us with a very uh, elegant and beautiful solution to oxygen sensing. And of course, as you heard, this led to the Nobel Prize in uh, 2019. Uh, and so here is actually that uh, microscope, which is now on display uh, in Stockholm, if you happen to pass by uh, the Nobel uh, Museum, uh, along with my other uh, doctor instruments from when I was an intern uh, and resident. On the right is the tie that uh, any doctor who's trained in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins wears uh, every Friday. Uh, and the brown bag is the doctor bag I carried with me uh, when I was an intern and a resident. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. And I think I just hit the zero mark. Thank you very much, Dr. Kayleen, for this uh, for this stimulating talk. I don't know if you can see our audience, but the auditorium was listening very attentively. Uh, there are loads of students here today with us, and it's not every day that we have the opportunity of listening to a Nobel Prize in Medicine. So thank you very much. And I want to thank also Adam, um, the Chief Scientific Officer for Nobel Prize Outreach for helping me chair this session today from London. Thank you very much to both of you. And I think it's time now to open the floor to the students and the audience in general for questions. So I would invite any of you who want to ask any questions to Dr. Kaling related to directly or indirectly to the talk that he's given us today to go up to the left-hand side of the auditorium to go to the microphone. Um, this is the arrangement, the COVID-19 protocol. So you have to go to that little stage there and formulate your questions. 
I have to say, Dr. Kaylin, that Spanish audiences are relatively shy. This doesn't reflect, it does, this doesn't translate into lack of interest. It's usually just the opposite. People need some time to process. There's somebody who wants to break the ice. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elsa. I'm a student that is starting his investigatory in science career. And I would like to ask you if you can give any us any tips on how to deal with burnout uh, because sometimes uh, science is a little bit frustrating because we don't obtain the results we want in the time that we want. You know, I think that's a really uh, wonderful and important question. So, you know, the first thing I, I think about with regard to your question is, does science feel like fun to you at least some of the time? Or does it feel like work? Because I think, as you say, it is hard, it is challenging, and it can be frustrating. Uh, and so I think one question is, nonetheless, are there times when you just think, wow, this is so much fun, and it's a privilege to do this. And in that regard, one of my rules of thumb is, precisely for the reason you stated, anytime something in the lab works, it can be simple, it could be trivial, but anytime something works, I say it's important to stop and enjoy that moment. Uh, you know, it, it, it could be that you're, you've got ampicillin resistant bacteria on your plates after you spread them out the night before and you got some colonies from your plasmid uh, transformation. It could be your restriction digest worked. It could be you got a band of the right size. Even these simple things are little triumphs or little victories. So I think it's really important to take uh, joy in those things that do work. And if you're lucky on occasion, really uh, important things will work in your hands. And then you really will say, you know, this was a great privilege uh, to be able to do this as my career because it was so much fun. Because frankly, as you know, most people go to work each day because they simply want to put a roof over their head and have food on the table. They don't go to work because they enjoy what they're doing so much. So. I hope despite the frustrations, which as you, you correctly state are part of this business, you, you nonetheless have moments where you say, wow, for example, I understand something that's never been understood before. And I only understand it because I was very clever and I did the right experiment. And, and that to me is, is priceless. And so but the last thing I'll say is people have asked me over time, you know, about winning the Nobel prize. And of course I'm thrilled that I won the Nobel prize but but the moment we understood HIF was prolohydroxylase, we looked at the data and we knew that nature had come up with a really elegant and beautiful mechanism. And we were the first human beings in the history of mankind to understand that that was absolutely priceless. And whether I did or did not eventually win the Nobel Prize, I, I would still have said that was the greatest moment of my life. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Hi, my name is Alba Moran. I'm doing my PhD in prostate cancer and diabetes. And first of all, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I was wondering if back then when you were starting to work with HIF, did you know then that what you were doing was going to make a difference? Had you that feeling that moment? Yeah. Oh, I love this question. This is a great question on multiple levels because it's near and dear to my heart. So it, it is true that based on my clinical training, I thought if we understood the functions of the VHL gene well enough, maybe, maybe that would create opportunities to do something therapeutically useful, whether it was to treat kidney cancer or whether it was to block angiogenesis, to treat anemia, maybe in time, heart attacks and strokes. So yes, that was in the back of my mind. But there's, I think there's something really important in your question. I think today, unfortunately, young people, especially, but all scientists in general, feel too much pressure to justify what they're doing in terms of its eventual uh, application. Uh, and that's not how real scientific discovery works. Real, real breakthroughs in translational medicine and applied science simply occur when a line of investigation that usually started with some basic fundamental questions matures to the point where you actually understand something well enough that you can actually do something, okay? So, and, and there have been many, many examples over time 
of discoveries that went in directions you could not have possibly anticipated at the beginning, but nonetheless led to potential application. So, uh, for example, think about the 2020 Nobel laureates who were recognized for their work on CRISPR gene editing. The, the people who really gave us that wonderful and powerful technology were just following their curiosity. And we're trying to understand how bacteria protect themselves from viruses. And I don't know that any of them could have imagined that this would now change uh, medicine in the way it is going to change medicine in terms of the ability to go in and to precisely uh, change genetic sequences uh, in, in cells. And, and, and so I, I think one of the take home messages here is support fundamental basic science. Again, hopefully you have a good nose for a problem to work on. And so uh, if something strikes you as interesting, you know, and you follow it, I hope if you're lucky as I was, that it will lead to some moment where you say, aha, I can now do something that's truly useful with this information. But I think it's short-sighted just to, to link scientific funding and scientific support to the question of, well, how is this gonna change, for example, patient care in the next five years? Because if, if you, you know, that, that's so hard to predict. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. More questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask you, uh, which stage of your career have you enjoyed the most or the least? Like being a student, being a postdoc, or maybe uh, managing your own lab? Another great question. So uh, first of all, I think I've liked each stage for different reasons. And I think one of my rules of thumb, getting back to one of the earlier questions, you know, any year where you're surrounded by talented people and you're learning some new things and you're having fun and people are paying you for it is, is a pretty good year. Uh, I've, I've never regretted, for example, anything I, I learned earlier in my life because sometimes it came back to pay dividends later in my life in ways I couldn't have anticipated. Uh, and so, but I go back to saying they're all very different. So uh, as a postdoc, I, I would say that was a thrilling time in my life because I was doing the experiments with my very own hands. And if I made a discovery, I, I literally was the person responsible for executing the experiment. I often saw the result even before uh, my mentor. So uh, that was exhilarating. Uh, at the same time, it was also a little bit terrifying because it was sort of like a zero or a one. I felt like I was gonna succeed or I was gonna fail because I had my, my project and either I was gonna succeed with this project or not, uh, or at least that's what it felt like to me at times. So I think it was thrilling, but also a little bit terrifying. I'm, I'm glad I was young because when you're young, you can tolerate such uh, anxiety, I think perhaps a little bit better. Uh, at the same time, I have a different kind of satisfaction now running a laboratory uh, because I, I still get a, a vicarious satisfaction uh, and joy watching my trainees now have that experience I had as a postdoc and to see the joy in their faces when they do a great experiment and get a wonderful uh, or exciting uh, result. And, 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 and I think as a, I try to remind my postdocs, the good news now is that because I have a lab of 10 to 15 people, it's, it's, it tends to smooth out the highs and the lows. So it, it tends to make it less binary. You know, when, again, when I was a postdoc, I felt like a zero or a one, but as a, as a PI, almost everyone at any given time might have something interesting. So it kind of smooths out the highs uh, and the lows to be a, to be a, a, a lab director. Uh, what I dislike uh, about being a lab director are uh, some of the things that are really sort of tangential to science, uh, more sociological or you know, the economics of you know, running the business of my laboratory. Uh, I, I'm not thrilled with that, but fortunately I've been very generously supported over time. So somehow I've patched together the support, but uh, I, I'd rather think about the science. I don't, for example, like arguing about things that don't matter, such as whether someone should be third author or fourth, fourth author on a paper. Uh, I, I'd rather talk about, you know, the discovery and what it means to the world and what it means to individual people's uh, careers. So I, I've liked each stage for different reasons, I would, I would. Thank you very much. More questions? 
maybe while people are processing questions, um, I would like to ask something to William Kaling because um, I feel like the odd woman out here because I'm from the medical humanities field, like I'm not a medical doctor, uh, I'm not a scientist, um, but I um, find it very refreshing to exchange ideas with people like everybody here in the audience basically who look at the question of illness or health from a scientific perspective and uh, to compare those views with my own views um, as a literary scholar basically looking at illness and health from its rep cultural representations and i wanted to ask you about the metaphor of war that has been used uh, and overused, at least here in Spain, but I think internationally, to refer to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and since your research has also been focused on cancer, and cancer has also been yes. Um, yes. talked about in the media, particularly as, as a war, as a battlefield, yes. also yes. chemotherapy and the treatments. I was wondering, how do you feel to this usage of the war metaphor and war language to refer to what basically started as a health crisis? Thank you. Yeah, you know, that's a wonderful, astute uh, question. And it leads me first to something that I think is also very important for not only our fellow scientists to understand, but also perhaps even more importantly, policymakers to understand. So I started out with my picture of Sputnik. So of course, when I was three years old, President Kennedy said we would put a man on the moon in 10 years, and we did it. That's in stark contrast to when uh, then President Nixon in the 1970s said, we're gonna have a war on cancer. And of course, we're still engaged in the war. In fact, sadly, my wife died of cancer in 20. 15. So what's, what's the difference? Well, I've come to appreciate that the difference is when Kennedy said we were going to put a man on the moon, all of the science that you needed to know to put a man on the moon was to a first approximation already known. So it wasn't so much a scientific enterprise as it was an engineering enterprise. And when you're doing an engineering enterprise, you can be a little bit more confident about the timelines, the deliverables, in this case, putting a man on the moon, and the cost, and you actually do want everybody working in lockstep, going in the same direction. That's how you handle an engineering problem. But unfortunately, uh, cancer for most of my life uh, has been largely a scientific problem. Now we are, we are starting to convert certain aspects of it to an engineering problem, such as you know we can now rapidly sequence and identify all the mutations within a given uh, tumor. So that's now become more of an engineering uh, issue. Uh, but it's fundamentally a scientific problem. And when you're doing a scientific problem, you really have to leave room for what sociologists call the lone hunter-gatherer scientists who just want to follow their curiosity and see where the road takes them. Because again, over and over, that's where the really big transformative discoveries come from. And so you don't want to treat a scientific problem like an engineering problem. You want to treat it uh, like a scientific problem where there's room for those creative individuals who can complement the scientists who want to work more uh, in, in teams. And again, I think for funders, it's really important to appreciate this difference uh, because it's simply not fair to say, we'll fund you, but we want, it, we want you to tell us what you're going to be doing four to five years from now and what the outcome of that work is going to be. Because if you know the answers to that, you're not really doing science. You're either doing engineering or you're doing science that's so trivial, it's almost self-fulfilling. So now to your word, the war. So I do cringe a little bit uh, when I hear war because it does, I think, create a certain amount of fatigue after a while, if year in and year out, it's this war against cancer, it's now the war against COVID. I, I, I fear it does create a little bit of fatigue and doesn't capture this nuance I just discussed of science, science and engineering. And then the last thing I'll say, because I'm asked this a lot, why were we able to go so fast with COVID compared to, for example, cancer? Uh, and I would argue it relates to some of the things we just discussed. First of all, we had invested for decades in understanding the you know, basic virology, in some cases, studying viruses that were of no medical consequence whatsoever, but equipped us with the knowledge to understand or guess what some of the genes were doing with COVID. So, I, and so, so 
thinking about how you would make a vaccine for COVID had been largely reduced to an engineering problem compared to a scientific problem. Uh, the big breakthrough, of course, was the mRNA technology for making vaccine, but that's another perfect example of people who were sort of languishing in obscurity, just studying nucleic acid biology, and then they came up with this very important uh, discovery about how you could uh, alter uh, mRNA to make it a more uh, effective vaccine. And then the final thing uh, I'll say, which of course this audience knows, is that to a first approximation, uh, the COVID problem is a 10 gene problem, uh, and the cancer problem is a 10,000 gene uh, problem. So we're getting there, but it's an order of magnitude, orders of magnitude more complicated in terms of uh, thinking about the various genes and, and their various interactions with one another. Thank you very much. Any more questions? We still have some time for one or two more questions. I'm Juan Ramon Tejedor from the Cancer Epigenetics Labs, very inspiring talk, by the way. Uh, I was surprised by your, your affairs in the past with mathematics and computers. And I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on the, on the field of computational biology uh, in the following years uh, in terms of uh, new drug designs or even in the war yeah. against cancer? Terrific. Well, the first thing I would say is, uh, again, ironically, when I was uh, a high school student, college student, I didn't actually like biology because it was so descriptive and phenomenologic. Uh, of course, that's changed dramatically today. So maybe I would have liked biology a little bit more now. Uh, what mathematics did give me and what computer science did give me, which is priceless or invaluable, is it taught me a way to think clearly and logically and rigorously, which is as important in biology as it is in mathematics. In fact, there's a wonderful book I will recommend to uh, the young people called uh, How Not to Be Wrong, How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking. Uh, which I, I now would recommend to all young scientists because it's about clear thinking, logical thinking. But uh, to come back to your question, yes, there's this wonderful convergence now because computational biology is incredibly important. Now, again, you have to find what you find interesting and what you find exciting. And so it, it may not be for everybody, but clearly computational biology is here to stay. Uh, it's clearly part of the future. It's going to be only more important with time. Uh, and all sorts of aspects of biology and, and medicine. You touched on a couple of them. So, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's the time you live in. Maybe if I was a young person today, given my mathematical and computer science skills, I would have gone into computational biology. Thank you. There is time for one final question. Anybody? Students, staff? Yeah, there we go. Well, hello, uh, I'm Hector. I'm a student at ASELSA, a biotechnology student here in the university. Um, and I wanted to know what made you uh, keep going when you kept failing? For example, we saw that you got Bs instead of As, and it was just the challenge or it was like something else? Uh, well, th that experience I had in high school was really transformative to me when I finally, through luck, had the opportunity to be immersed in a curriculum that I actually enjoyed because it was challenging and exciting and where I was really surrounded by very smart people who pushed me. So once I had that experience, from that point forward, uh, I was determined to be a much better student and to challenge myself to be constantly striving to be at the, for example, the best institution I could be at or the best lab I could be at. And so that's what I did. So I, you know, I yes, I was disappointed when I got uh, rejected from certain uh, universities, but I was lucky enough to go to Duke and there are lots of schools and places where you can get a great education. So I was just determined to be the best student I could be. I told you about the disappointment of Harvard Medical School, but I got into another very good medical school. So I think part of the answer is uh, use every rejection and disappointment as motivation. Uh, I actually think it was a great advantage <laughs> to have a little bit of what we call a chip on my shoulder that I still had to prove myself. I mean, I sometimes see young people who think they've arrived, <clears throat> uh, that the world owes them something, uh, that they're so wonderful. And I, I often am concerned about such people. I think it's better to always feel like you have to prove something. Uh, uh, for example, there are a lot of scientists, including myself, who feel like on one level, I'm only as good as my last experiment. Uh, and this despite winning the Nobel 
surprise. So uh, I think it's always good to have a little bit of an edge, feel like you have to prove something. And you know, the other answer regarding the disappointments is what I said earlier. You know, it's for that reason precisely, you have to take joys in the successes, you know, the experiments that work. Uh, and uh, I guess the last thing I'll say in that regard is, and this might sound paradoxical coming from a Nobel laureate, I think if you set out in science with your goal to, being to win great prizes and accolades, uh, you may well wind up being very disappointed and bitter. But if you're going into science because you love science and you love the discovery process, uh, that's first of all, the real prize. And secondly, and perhaps ironically, if you do your science well and you're a bit lucky on occasion, you may actually win a prize. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much um, for all these interesting questions and thank you very much, Dr. Kaling, for your time. I think it's a great opportunity for a student of medicine to be able to exchange ideas and to talk to you. So thank you very much for all this time. And now just um, a few closing words. I would like to thank the, um, on behalf of all the Asturian team here to uh, thank the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative again for making this uh, meeting with Dr. Kaylee impossible today, this afternoon. And I want to extend our words of gratitude to the AstraZeneca Foundation, represented here by, by, his, by its director, and also to ISPA, the Institute for Health Research of the Principality of Asturias, and to FIMBA, the Foundation for Biomedical Research and Innovation of Asturias, and especially to Dr. Mario Fernandez Fraga, the Deputy Director of ISPA, and to Guillermo del Riego, communication responsible for FIMBA, for setting all of this in motion. Thank you, uh, of course, to, to Borja, to our counselor, for his presence here today. We're aware you have a very busy diary, so thank you for making time for being with us here today. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, all the technical staff on both sides, because without you guys, this really wouldn't have been possible at all. And uh, so thank you, all of you. And um, finally, I would, I, I would like to say that I think opportunities such as this are great for both the students and researchers in general and the audience in general, because it hel it, they help us to see how a scientist becomes a scientist or how a professional becomes a professional. Like we had some glimpses into Dr. Kaylin's biography and even to see this rejected letter uh, can be very encouraging because even a Nobel Prize laureate was rejected at some point and as Borja has said like failure and disappointment are kind of natural states in the process of research so that has been very encouraging and as I said a few you know at the beginning of the session I think this talk will stay with us for a long time it will be a source of inspiration and it's fabulous to create this kind of third space in between the sciences and the community so that science reaches society and not just the scientific community uh, per se. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed as much as I, I have. And thank you to all the students, everybody who's, who's made these very, very interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you.